I'm going to read from Ezekiel 38, and uh, I'm going to read three sections of this chapter. I'm going to read a lot of verses, but rather than read the whole chapter, I'm going to read it in three sections just so that we get the whole context of of what Ezekiel is talking about here. So starting in chapter 38, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to me, Ezekiel writes, saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against him and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. I will turn you around, put hooks into your jaws, and lead you out with all your army, horses and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya are with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer and all its troops, the house of Tugarma from the far north, and all its troops, many people are with you. Jump down to verse 10. Thus says the Lord God, on that day it shall come to pass that thoughts will arise in your mind and you will make an evil plan. You will say, I will go up against a land of unwalled villages. I will go to a peaceful people who dwell safely. It's talking about Israel. All of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates to take plunder and to take booty. Now, that's not the kind you shake, all right? It's... It's just, you know, it's money, it's plunder. Okay, I just have to qualify that because lingo today is, I don't want anybody reading this going, take booty, all right. (laughs) And to stretch out your hand against the waste places that are again inhabited and against the people gathered from the nations who have acquired livestock and goods who dwell in the midst of the land, Sheba, Dedan, the merchants of Tarshish and all their young lions will say to you, have you come to take plunder? Have you gathered your army? to take booty, to, get, to carry away silver and gold, to take away livestock and goods, to take great plunder. Jump down to verse 18. And it will come to pass at the same time when Gog comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, that my fury will show in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath, I have spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel. So that the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, and the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep on the earth, and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountains shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against Gog throughout all my mountains, says the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother, and I will bring him to judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him, on his troops, and on the many peoples who are with him, flooding rain, great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. And thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. And everybody said amen to that. So today is part two in a three-part series as we bring the book of Ezekiel to a close, uh, a series that I've entitled Israel and the End Times. Again, this is part two. And if you were with us, uh, so last week, Stefan filled for me, but the week before, if you were with us the week before when I launched part one, I mentioned to you that the last 13 chapters of the book of Ezekiel are prophetic in nature. He, you know, he's writing here in the, you know, mid-sixth century BC, but he's, but he's looking forward even to our time and beyond. And some of the things in these last 13 chapters have already occurred in our lifetime, uh, in some of your lifetimes, and some of the things he writes about have yet to occur. And so, as I mentioned two weeks ago, that the last uh, 13 chapters can be divided into three sections. Uh, The first section we covered last time, chapters 36 and 37, Ezekiel prophesies about the reestablishment of the state of Israel. Well, that happened. That was fulfilled in 1948. And then the last few chapters of the book of Ezekiel, chapters 40 to 48, have to do with the kingdom age, otherwise known as the millennial kingdom. That's next week's study. For today, we're looking at this middle section, chapters 38 and 39, which deals with the battle of Armageddon. And so Ezekiel is prophesying about nations that will converge and what God's response will be to those nations that converge to this 
climactic battle that most people who don't even go to church are at least familiar with in name. You know, most people understand, oh, the Battle of Armageddon, you know, there's this big battle that's going to happen. When is that going to happen? We don't know. But Ezekiel talks about things that line up uh, in regards to the Battle of Armageddon that I think we can see a glimpse of in terms of the infancy of the formation of some of these things in our day. And I'll talk about it more as we look into this chapter today. Uh, So sit back and buckle up because today, uh, get ready for Armageddon. That's what the topic is for today. And I don't mean the 1998 kind with Bruce Willis and Ben Affleck. I mean the one that is to come starring Jesus, because it's going to be a real war. It's going to be a real battle of all battles. And the Lord is going to return and um, put an end to all of this. And so we're going to talk about that today. Now, if you've invited friends or, um, you know, neighbors and you're thinking, I want you to come visit my church. And, and now you're worried <laughs> because they're going to leave here thinking, oh, great, the world's going to blow up. And thanks for inviting me to church. It's not going to be that, that you know, depressing. So just hang in there. But we're going to get through uh, some of the hard stuff before we get to uh, the stuff that is promising and hopeful. Let's pray first. Father, we come before you thankful for the cross, thankful for what you've done for us through Jesus Christ. And as we open up your word now and we look at the prophecies of Ezekiel, as we continue to look ahead to these things that you've warned us about well in advance, uh, we do pray that our hearts would not become heavy, but that in fact our hearts would be hopeful because we know how this book ends. And, and we know that you are always on the throne and that you're coming again. So, Lord, we lift our heads up. We look up, you know, that our redemption is near. And we pray that you would help us to persevere and that we would continue to occupy until you come, that we would live out our lives in wonderful ways, influencing our world with, with, um, with Christ, flavoring it like salt. Um, that we might see as many people come to faith in Jesus before the end of the age, Lord. And we know that's your heart, and so we pray that you would use us to that end. And we love you, we praise you, we thank you together in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. There is a classic children's story that was a book uh, many years ago. I I remember reading it as a kid. I don't know when it was first written. It later became an animated Disney movie, like in 2005 or something like that. Uh, called, uh, it, was all, it was all about a chicken called Chicken Little. How many of you remember Chicken Little? Now, in, in the book version, Chicken Little was a female. In the movie version, they made the chicken a male. I guess, you know, that's fanciful these days. So we're just going to flip genders a little bit. But in the original book, Chicken Little was a female. And here's what happens. An acorn falls on her head. And she begins to think that the sky is falling. And so with great panic, she starts warning all of her uh, poultry pals, all of her feathered friends, all of her bird buddies. Now, I worked on that, friends, so that doesn't come naturally. And thank you very much. They're one person like that. Poultry pals, feathered friends, and bird buddies. And so Henny Penny and Ducky Lucky and Goosey Lucy and Turkey Lurkey all get warned. And they, they share the panic. Sky's falling. Sky's falling. And along comes Foxy Loxy. You remember in the story? And Foxy Loxy's like, this is such a great day. And they're like, no, it's not. Not a great day. The sky is falling. We're all doomed. And we're on our way to warn the king. So I lead with that little children's story because I want to lead with a little word of caution. Please do not, in the course of this Bible study, become Christian little. Where you think, oh, doomsday, and the sky is falling, and, you know, disaster is at hand. Okay, don't do that, all right? And and the reason you you shouldn't do that is because, yes, Armageddon is prophesied as a real war. And, yes, it will really happen. But it also means the return of Jesus Christ. And, yes, and Jesus... And his return is the blessed hope of the church. And so while we read about things that might look like doomsday in our Bibles, and there's plenty of that, I mean, not not just here, this is kind of mild compared to like Revelation and other places. We have to always remember that Jesus is coming again. And he intends to rescue his bride. And this is what Jesus said in John 14, verses 1 to 3. He said, let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You believe in God, believe also, trust also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. 
If it were not so, I would have told you. But I go to prepare a place for you. Listen, he's gone back to heaven. He's preparing a place for us. He says, and I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you might be also. So he, even his parting words to us before he ascends uh, is to remember he's coming again. So don't be troubled. Don't be anxious. Don't be afraid. Jesus is going to rescue us. He's going to take us to be with him forever. But that said, Jesus even warned us in addition that there will be wars and rumors of wars before his second coming. And Ezekiel's talking about this here in chapter 38. The lead in here in Ezekiel chapter 38 is to let us know that there will be a confederation of nations that will join together and converge against Israel. Their target is Israel. Now, that's the specific target, but the target, the, the broader target is the God of Israel. So nations will be inspired, no doubt, demonically. You know, anti-Semitism is, is just really satanically inspired. And, um, and so nations with rage and anger towards uh, Israel and towards the God of Israel will converge and form this confederation. And, and Ezekiel talks about it. And the player who is at the lead of this military campaign is none other than Russia. Now, I don't say that because it's just kind of a fanciful thing these days to blame Russia for everything. Am I right? We're blaming Russia for everything. Okay, listen, I say that because the Bible actually specifically names Russia as the principal player in this military campaign that's going to happen against the nation of Israel. And this is significant because the, the second most uh, significant player in this military campaign is Iran. Uh, you're, we're going to see here in, in chapter 38. And this is very timely news because, listen, we're living in a day when I think we are seeing some of this unfold in our lifetime. Never before has there been the kind of alliance between Russia and Iran that there is today. That is very significant in terms of end time prophecy. And Ezekiel, 2,500 years ago, tells us this will be the lead alliance that will come against Israel. Other nations will join them, but this is the lead alliance. So when you look here at, with me in your Bibles to Ezekiel 38, Ezekiel names six nations, a part of this confederation of nations that will come against Israel, including and led by, as I mentioned, Russia. And I want to point out this to you. Look again at verses 1 and 2. In verse 1, he, he says, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog. Circle the word Gog in the margin of your Bible. Write title. This is a person. And Gog is a title like czar or prince. And we know that it's a person because he gets a personal pronoun at the end of verse 2 where, where God says, uh, and prophesy against him. So Gog is an individual, and Gog is literally a title, meaning either czar or prince, and he is the prince over a region that is called Magog, also there in your Bibles uh, in verse 2. And circle the word Magog. Now, the ancient historians Josephus, Pliny, and Herodotus all said that the ancient land of Magog was the ancient land of the Scythians. And the ancient land of the Scythians was north of the Black and Caspian Seas. So there's great unanimity on the fact that the territory of Magog is Russia, is Russia in modern terms. Furthermore, Meshach and Tubal are mentioned there as part of the territory of Magog. Uh, Meshach is thought to be, by most Bible scholars, Moscow. And Tubal is believed to be a town called Tobolsk. Tobolsk is in west central Russia and used to be the Siberian oil capital. So all of these things put together, Gog meaning czar or prince, Magog, the land of the Scythians, today Russia, uh, perhaps Moscow, Tobolsk, all of this is pointing to Russia. They are the lead military force in this campaign against Israel. And joining Russia in this confederation are five other nations. And the first on the list in verse 5 
is none other than the second most prominent country mentioned in the news today, which is, as I mentioned, Iran. Now, Iran is listed here by its ancient name, Persia, in verse 5. Do you see that? Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya. So the primary country joining Russia is Persia. Up until 1935, Iran was always named Persia. It was only since 1935 that Persia has been now since called Iran. Until the, uh, the Islamic Revolution of 1979, Iran was actually an ally of the United States and Israel. Prior to 1979, the Shah of Iran was selling oil to Israel, but the Islamic Revolution changed all that. And uh, now as a result, uh, they are, they're not an ally, they are a, a hostile adversary in, in the Middle East region, in the Far East region, and, um, and, and they need to be recognized as such. And today, we are seeing a Russian-Iranian alliance that has never existed before like it does now. And we're seeing biblical prophecy fulfilled in our own day. So here's, for example, just a picture of uh, how cozy it is right now between uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin and Iranian President Hassan Rouhani. And, um, you know, they have engaged in um, nuclear deals, in arms deals. In fact, within the last two years, Russia and Iran has entered into a $10 billion arms deal. Uh, Russia has recently, uh, I read this one article that talked about how it recently delivered its advanced S-300 missile defense system to Iran after years of debate over the purchase and warnings from the United States, but nevertheless it, it happened. In the last couple of years, Russia and Iran negotiated a $10 billion arms deal allowing Iran to purchase T-90 tanks, artillery systems, and aircraft from Moscow that are expected to keep the Islamic Republic fully armed over the next several years. So Iran will become fully armed over the next few years solely by the aid of Russia, to say nothing of the assistance in terms of nuclear capability. Russian National Security Council Secretary Nikolai Petrushev recently said this, quote, in the context of the statements made by our partners with regard to a major regional power, namely Iran, I would like to say the following. Iran has always been, which isn't really true, has always been and remains our ally and partner with which we are consistently developing relations both on bilateral basis and within multilateral formats. According to Alexei Pushkov, a member of the upper house of Russian legislature and close ally of President Vladimir Putin, Russia and Iran have created, quote, a durable alliance. He described Russia-Iran relations as, quote, a partnership which can evolve into a strategic relationship. So it's happening. Now, um, a, a little, you know, personal uh, political commentary at this moment. I think that the Iran nuclear deal was a disaster. I'm thankful that our president, President Trump, withdrew the United States from that Iranian deal that was made in 2015. I think it's good for us to get out of that deal. But I also believe that the unintended consequence of that has pushed Iran and Russia closer together. Uh, because now Iran has gone into the arms of Russia even more so. And I mean that literally and I mean that figuratively. They've gone into the arms of Russia. Russia's held their arms out for a big hug of Iran. And they've gone literally in the sense that now they are relying even more on arms, armament from Russia than they ever, ever have before. The sanctions imposed by the United States on Iran I, again, I think are good. I just think that the unintended consequences are that we're going to see this line up even more, what Ezekiel is talking about here, this Russian-Iranian alliance, where they're going to become even closer allies as the United States pushes uh, against both of them. So this is what's happening. We're seeing all of this emerging in our lifetime. Now, in just this past summer, June of 2019, at the end of June, Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, called a trilateral summit in Jerusalem with Russia, Israel, and the United States, trying to coax Russia away from Iran. It was not successful, but in the middle of this trilateral summit, this is what Prime Minister Netanyahu said, quote, Israel will not allow Iran, which calls for our destruction, to establish itself on our border, and will do all we can to prevent it from getting a nuclear weapon, end quote. And they will, friends. 
Uh, they will. They will take military action and they may go solo on it, but it's going to happen. So this is all kind of coming to a head. We're seeing some of this all beginning to uh, arrange itself in a way that aligns with biblical prophecy. I'm always cautious to say that this is exactly what it is, you know, because I'm uh, reminded even in our own history when during World War II, the church was convinced that Hitler was the Antichrist and Mussolini was the false prophet. And, and when they saw panzer tanks lining up against their churches, Christians thought, well, the rapture's gonna come. And then that didn't happen. So it's dangerous sometimes to always look at, you know, world events and say, this must mean this. But I think it's prudent for us to at least recognize what is happening in our day and see that it is very, very similar to some of the things that Ezekiel is prophesying about here in chapter 38. If you look further in chapter 38 in verse 5, we see other nations that align with this Russia-Iranian alliance. We see Ethiopia mentioned in verse 5. Some of your Bibles use the ancient Hebrew name Cush. We're talking about Ethiopia. That's also the region of northern Sudan. Uh, Ethiopia, according to the U.S. State Department, is 45% Sunni Muslim. And northern Sudan is uh, 70% Sunni Muslim. And then also joining Ethiopia is Libya, or some of your Bibles use the ancient Hebrew name Put. Libya is 97% Sunni Muslim. In other words, this represents the Islamic states of the Upper Nile region of Africa that will converge against Israel. And joining them in verse 6, Gomer and Togarma. Now, those of you who hearken back to the Andy Griffith days, don't get Gomer in your head that way. Golly, this is instead talking about East. Some of you young are like, what's that? Just Google it. You'll, have, you'll, you'll laugh. Gomer in biblical prophecy represents Eastern Europe. We're talking Germany and Poland. And to Garma is modern day Turkey and the area also that would include Armenia and Georgia. And so these nations converge. This Russian-Iranian alliance is going to be joined by Ethiopia and Northern Sudan and Turkey and, and uh, Georgia and Armenia and Germany and Poland. They're going to converge. But then, in verse 13 here of the same chapter, there will be a few nations that question them. Like, what are you doing? Like, why are you coming against Israel? And among them listed here, verse 13, Sheba and Dedan. Now, Sheba and Dedan always go together in the Bible, and they are a reference to Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is going to rise up and say, why are you guys converging against Israel? It's very interesting. You know, what's their stake in it that they would actually question? And along with them questioning this is Tarshish. Now, where exactly is Tarshish located? Herodotus, the ancient historian, said that Tarshish was located beyond the pillars of Hercules. What are the pillars of Hercules? The pillars of Hercules were the rock formation that formed the entrance to the Mediterranean Sea, otherwise known as the Strait of Gibraltar. So Herodotus said that Tarshish was out of the Mediterranean Sea into the Atlantic. Most Bible scholars believe Tarshish is a reference to England. And in addition to England and joining Saudi Arabia, it also mentions in verse 13, the merchants of Tarshish and all her young lions, a part of questioning this military campaign. What is the, what is the national symbol for England? It's a, it's a lion. And uh, there's actually three, but the animal that is the national symbol is a lion. And so the young lions with Tarshish is probably a reference to British territories. Now this may be, and I say maybe, because we don't know, this may be the only veiled reference to the United States, seeing as how we once were a British colony before the American Revolutionary War. Otherwise, there's no mention of the United States. Have you ever wondered, where does the U.S. fall in biblical prophecy? We're not really mentioned, friends. This may be the only veiled reference. And it might be, because some scholars believe, that all of these events begin to transpire right around the time of the rapture. And so when the church, when Christians are snatched from the earth, what will be the population of the United States? What will be the military force of the United States? What will be the executive branch, legislative, judicial branch in the United States if, in fact, Christians are taken, raptured from the earth? We might be rendered, you know, not a world power. When you, see, when you can imagine tens of thousands of Christians instantly leaving the United States, being taken to heaven as Christians, Perhaps we're not mentioned in biblical prophecy because we're not a formidable force at that point. Who really knows? 
Now, there are other missing players in this campaign here. There's no mention of Egypt, there's no mention of Jordan, there's no mention of Syria. That might be because since 1979, Egypt has had a peace treaty with Israel. In fact, when Egypt entered into a peace treaty with Israel in 1979, the Arab League of Nations kicked them out. They brought them back 10 years later in 1989, but Egypt has maintained peaceful accord in relations with Israel. Jordan in the same way, 1994, Jordan entered into a peace treaty with Israel. Could it be for those reasons that they're not mentioned here as a force against Israel? Syria may in fact be out of the picture because they've been rendered helpless and useless. In Isaiah 17 verse 1 and again in verse 4, Isaiah prophesies about the day that Damascus will be a heap of ruins. So perhaps that's already happened at this point. So Saudi Arabia, England, perhaps even the U.S. will question why these nations are converging against Israel, but none will come to Israel's aid. Nobody. Not, not, not any nations at least except one, and that is the Lord. The Lord, Psalms 121 verse 4 says, indeed, he, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The truth is Israel doesn't need any nations to come to her defense because the Lord is her defense. And the Lord will rise up and defend his nation and his name for his glory. And all of this culminates here in the battle of Armageddon. And so, between verses 18 and 23, at the end of Ezekiel 38, there's this description here against Gog and God's judgment that is going to come against these nations. And I just want to read uh, verses 18 to 23 again. I'm going to ask you to underline certain words, and then I'm going to compare it with Revelation 16, which is the only place where Armageddon is actually mentioned. But first, look again here at verses 18 to 23. And it will come to pass at the same time when God comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, that my fury will show in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath, underline that word, I have spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great earthquake, underline great earthquake, in the land of Israel, so that the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep on the earth and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountains shall be thrown down, underline that. The steep places shall fall and every wall shall fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against Gog throughout all my mountains, says the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother and I will bring him to judgment with pestilence, underline that, and bloodshed. I will rain down on him, on his troops and on the many peoples who are with him, flooding rain, gr great hailstones, underline that, fire and brimstone. Thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. Quickly turn to the end of your Bibles, Revelation chapter 16. I'm almost done, but I want you to see the comparison between Revelation 16 and what we just read there at the end of Ezekiel 38. Revelation 16. This again is the only place where the word Armageddon is mentioned in all of the Bible. It's Revelation 16, verse 16. The verses leading up to it tell us that kings from the east will also come and join forces with the nations mentioned in Ezekiel 38 to come against Israel. So kings from the east, we're talking China, Japan, Korea, uh, we're talking uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, India, the whole Pacific Rim is gonna join forces with these other nations and they will converge against Israel. Now, some Bible scholars interpret the war of Ezekiel 38 and the war of Revelation 16 as two distinct wars. I believe instead, when you notice the similarities between Revelation 16 and what I just read at the end of Ezekiel 38, that in fact, what actually ends up happening is these two forces merge that you have all of these nations mentioned in Ezekiel 38 at the beginning of the tribulation, but they, they wage a campaign against Israel, and then it culminates with this battle of Armageddon where they are joined by these other kings from the east. Okay? So now notice the similarities here in Revelation 16, starting at verse 16. And they gathered them together to the place called, in Hebrew, Armageddon. 
And then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was, here's a similarity, a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. Now the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. That's another word that you underlined. Then every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. That's something else Ezekiel 38 said. And great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone, that was also in Ezekiel 38, about the weight of a talent. Look at me for a minute. The weight of a talent, a hundred pounds. Each hailstone. That's going to hurt. <laughs> your insurance is not going to cover that dent on your car. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague or pestilence, that's also Ezekiel 38, was exceedingly great. So you have all these similarities. Ezekiel talks about a great earthquake, talks about the wrath of God, he talks about hailstone, talk, he talks uh, here about pestilence, plague. The similarities are such that, again, I believe what you see unfolding in Ezekiel 38 is the beginning of the military campaign. It culminates in the Battle of Armageddon. But here's Here's the hope for the church. If you're still in Revelation, look over to chapter 19. We'll bring it to a close. Chapter 19. Because you see here, the Lord returns and he strikes down these nations that have come against him and have come against Israel. In Revelation 19, verse 11, John writes, Now I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself, and he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies of, in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. This is the church returning with him. And now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And he will return, and he will put an end to this battle, and he will display his power and his glory for all to see, which is how Ezekiel 38 ends, and I'll just recite it again. Ezekiel 38 verse 23 ends with this. Thus, God says, I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and then they shall know that I am the Lord. Amen and amen. God's ultimate purpose in all of the Bible is that people might know him. And sometimes he has to reveal himself in serious ways to get our attention. You might think to yourself, well, that's kind of an odd way of God getting people to know him by, you know, putting an end to this war and striking down the nations at the Battle of Armageddon. But listen to me on this. When nations are in full throttle opposition to God, God has to display his power and might greater than the opposition against him. It's like this. The harder you hit your head against a brick wall, the more it hurts. And that's the way it is with God. The harder you oppose Him, the more it hurts. But God will display Himself in all of His power and all of His glory so that people might know Him. See, there's no reason why you and I should fear the imminent return of the Lord. You and I shouldn't be afraid of the battle of Armageddon. Frankly, the way that I see Scripture and the timeline of events unfolding prophetically, I don't think we'll be here for the Battle of Armageddon. When you look at the timeline of events, I think the church is raptured before this climactic battle. And so we're going to be kept safely in heaven, and we are the ones clothed in white that return with the Lord in this great battle, and we fight on His behalf and for His glory, although He doesn't need us, but, you know, by the power of His breath, He will overthrow the armies that are opposed to Him. But we return with him because we've been kept safely in heaven because of the rapture or when we die knowing Christ, we've already gone to heaven. The, the, the final deal is this. It's, it's not about being afraid or worried. It's about being ready. 
And, and, I, and I leave us with, with these words of Jesus from Luke chapter 21, verse 28. He, he just reminded us, he says, when you see all these things begin to happen, he said, look up, lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. And so these things should stir our hearts to cause us to ask ourselves, am I ready? Am I, am I right with the Lord so that in that there's no fear of what's gonna happen? But listen, we know this, right? The world's getting crazy. And it's gonna get crazier still, and crazier still again. And Jesus is gonna come, and we're gonna be with him forever and ever. And when he returns again, he's gonna establish his kingdom on earth for a thousand years. And then after that, there's the new heaven and a new earth, and we shall be with him forever. Next week, you see, Ezekiel closes out with the, the study about the millennial kingdom when Christ comes on earth for a thousand years. So that's next week's study. But for today, lift up your heads and look up. Your redemption is near. May your hope be in the Lord, our maker, our helper, right? Know him. Be right with him. Then you don't have to be afraid of what is to come. We can rest in the Lord God Almighty. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you remind us in your word that though these things shall happen, we can trust you and we can look to you. I pray, Lord, that if anyone here doesn't know you in a personal way, that today they'd open their heart to you, Lord, that they sur would surrender to your lordship, that they would confess sin and ask you to forgive them and to come into their lives, that they might follow you they might live for you so that when we have relationship with you we can be comforted by these things that though the world is going to get crazier still there's going to be wars and rumors of wars we can have our hope and our confidence and our trust in you thank you lord for loving us and making yourself known we praise you together in jesus name and everybody said amen and amen god bless you all